everybody is so siloed that it took someone like me to interview the researchers over here, the experts over here, the designers who have gotten sick from just designing and touching the clothing, the garment workers, to pull it all together into one view and say, we have a problem here. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Welcome back, everybody, to Change Agents, an ironclad original, proudly presented by Montana Knife Company. Today's episode is about the toxic chemicals in clothing that are making people sick. And if you're anything like me, before this conversation, I had put almost no thought, if no thought whatsoever, into the items of clothing that I wear throughout my day to day life, when I'm working out, when I'm sleeping at night, and the impact it could potentially have on both my short and long-term health. My guest today is Alden Wicker. Alden is a journalist and author who has written investigative pieces for outlets including Wired, The New York Times, Inc. Magazine, Popular Science, Craftsmanship Quarterly, Vox, and others. Her reporting specializes on issues in the fashion industry, and her latest book is called To Die For, that's D-Y-E, how toxic fashion is making us sick and how we can fight back. The book is a startling investigation into how chemicals and materials used by many clothing brands are actually making people who wear them very sick. She's also the founder of a website called EcoCult, E-C-O Cult, that tracks and reports on sustainable fashion. You might ask yourself, well, what kind of toxic chemicals are we talking about in clothing? Well, they include metals such as arsenic, lead, mercury, nickel, and others that have been found in common clothing dyes. And health issues related to toxic chemicals in clothes have included everything from skin rashes and hair loss to respiratory, fertility, cognitive, and thyroid issues, and even birth defects. I think everybody can say they've heard about toxins. Like I'm used to hearing it about, you know, be careful what you eat. And a lot of times mm -hmm. that's through the protein source or what you drink or the dangers of plastic bottles or, you know, a variety of things. I'm not, I'm not new to hearing it until starting to do some research for this episode. I would be lying if I said I had ever thought about the chemicals that are involved in the process of making the clothing that we wear. And I don't know why that yeah, is. I feel like that's a huge uh, blind spot. Well, you're not alone. I mean, I didn't even know that this was a thing until uh, 2019. And I'd been writing about fashion sustainability for almost a decade by that point. And uh, so it, the reason why I found about, out about it, and I'd been writing about the same things that you just mentioned, you know, plastic packaging and food yeah. and cleaning products. And Ooh, that's another good products. one. Yes, I have heard about those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, so the, when I heard about this, it was because the Delta airline attendants were suing Land's End that made their uniforms. And, uh, that, you know, they were so sick, these flight attendants. Um, and this was female flight attendants, some male flight attendants. And this happened at four major airlines. So they would lose all their hair. They would get rashes so bad that they bled. Um, they would have uh, racing heart rate or extreme fatigue or both uh, blurry vision, brain fog. Um, some of them just became completely incapacitated by even being around their colleagues on a plane, even if they had lookalike uniforms that the airline had let them wear. And some of them, yeah, they were just disabled, uh, just breathing in the volatile organic compounds coming off of these uniforms. Um, and that was the first time I'd heard about this being a problem. I just, I just didn't know. And that sort of set me off on this journey. Four years later, I have a book out. And uh, it's it's pretty terrifying what I found. So years ago, I realized that the key to travel is you have to pick an airline and a hotel chain and a rental car company. And as long as you build status with them, travel professionally, although people think it's a beautiful thing and once you do it, you're exhausted by it, it does get a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. So I picked Delta 
back and I had just finished a trip where we got back flying Delta and I was looking at my Sky Miles account and it was open in 2001. I remember the day that the stewardesses and stewards showed up in their deep, rich, purple outfits that you are talking about. Because I remember them talking about they liked the color. Some Well, I take yeah. that back. They either really liked the color or they really didn't like the color. There was not a lot of overlap in between. The people were neutral. And then come to find out that, to to use the words that you did, it was the, the uniforms themselves were almost disabling some people. That's It's just wild that I actually had had a direct touch point in my life, the subject of, or a portion of the subject of your book. If, I mean, if you're a frequent flyer on Delta, it's actually an interesting thing to ask some of the flight attendants about this because some will, and you, you see this across health, health subjects, of course, some of them will be like, oh yeah, I'm whatever. And then some will be like, come meet me in the galley. I'll tell you all about Come it. sit down, a free cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. Well, how did it hit your radar? So yeah, so this radio, uh, this radio show, asked me to come on and, and get, you know, tell them about how this could be happening with these Delta airline attendants. And I didn't go on the show because I don't like to talk about things that I don't know anything about. And the question that arose for me was, there was a few questions. Why are these flight attendants getting sick? What is on these uniforms to make them sick? And is this happening to normal people too? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that final question is yes, this is impacting uh, regular folks wearing everyday clothing that you can buy at the store. So what did you discover in your research? Oh, where do I start? Wherever um, you well, want I to. <laughs> <laughs> so I discovered that fashion has the some of the most complex chemical layering of any consumer product that you and I can buy without a license. It is covered with so many different chemicals in so many different ways. I mean, you could have hundreds, thousands of different chemicals in one piece of fabric. One researcher at Duke told me that, you know, they do this thing called um, uh, full spectrum analysis, non-targeted analysis. Um, and it just shows them chemical signatures and then they have to match it to the literature. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these chemicals are not in the literature in the scientific literature. They don't have names. Nobody knows what they are, much less having been tested for human safety. So if we actually had full ingredient lists on our clothing, the way we do for cleaning products, for beauty products, for food, uh, it would be really shocking. It would The, the tag would be this long. Um, and it would include a lot of things that people know are toxic, mm -hmm. lead, phthalates, BPA, uh, PFAS, um, which is that, you know, like people are throwing out their nonstick pans now because yeah. uh, because of PFAS, which is carcinogenic, uh, reproductive toxic. Um, that same chemical or class of chemicals is used on clothing to make it stain repellent and water repellent. So your outdoor clothing, your children's school uniforms, period panties, all of these different things. Um, and then you have heavy metals like mercury, chromium, um, and then you have things that if, you know, if you read them, you'd be like, I have no, like, what is this? You would need mm -hmm. a chemistry degree to figure it out. And that applies to luxury brands, ultra fast fashion brands, children's brands, um, you know, even like sustainable brands can have pretty toxic chemicals on them. In your opinion, would it be safe to say that the organizations that are creating these items are aware of the potential. I mean, it. I, I may made another way to think about it. It seems like them not listing these ingredients is not an accidental step. Yes and no. There are some brands that are very, there's a spectrum. There are some brands that are very well aware. They have chemists on their team. They test things. They, uh, they spend millions of dollars testing things every year. They work closely with their suppliers. They've gotten, they've banned certain substances. There's some brands that have gone PFAS free um, and they're very aware and they're, they're on it. There are some brands that are aware and do diddly squat. 
they they don't even have a head of sustainability, much less somebody who even could understand what's going on. And they should they should know, like all of this information has been out there mm -hmm. for people in the fashion industry for quite some time, less so for consumers, but they just don't want to take the time or hire the personnel or invest the money to make their clothing safe. And honestly, they're not legally required to. I wonder if they wear their own brand. For sure. I think, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, it makes yeah, me, it I makes mean, me think back to, uh, oh, I just had the name of the movie. It was Erin Brockovich with Julia Roberts. And she went yeah. and met with a team of lawyers and she poured out water for them and said that it was from the wells near where their facilities were. I think I totally just butchered that. But the point being is none of those people wanted to drink the water. So it would be hard for them to say that they didn't recognize the danger. And it's just like, ah, no, I think we're good. We're not thirsty right now. I think that's not quite the whole story because for a long time, a lot of the experts in the fashion industry have been telling a story that it doesn't matter because we don't eat our clothes and it's under control. We're fine. And this is something I heard a lot from from experts, especially experts who are somehow paid by the industry. Like oh, the, industry, like the most objective. Clients. Yeah, the most objective ones, you mean. Right, right. So, for example, <laughs> I um, I was working with somebody who represented Okotex, which is a consumer facing label that brands pay for. Uh, where they get things tested and certified as is free of hazardous chemicals as safe um, and. I was working with him and I was like, hey, I bought a bunch of pieces to get tested from these brands. And I had chosen these really big brands because I could find no evidence of them having any sort of protocols to make sure their clothing didn't have toxic chemicals in them. And he insisted that it wasn't worth my time to test any of these big name brands. And I thought, oh, well, he must know something I don't, right? Like he's got this inside view of the industry. So I took all those big brands out and uh, tested some other things. But at the last minute, I threw in a pair of leather gloves from a mall brand that everybody's heard of. And they came back as a fail for very high amounts of chromium. And mm. later on, some of the brands that I had not gotten tested, which I can talk about because I didn't get that. So I had agreement that I was not allowed to share the name of any of the brands that they tested for me. But I didn't get these tested because he told me not to get them tested. So Land's End later was found by another nonprofit group, um, Silent Spring, to have high amounts of PFAS in its children's school uniforms. And that was one of the brands that I had bought and not gotten tested. And um you know, and then there's been other tests of of big brands around, you know, BPA, other hormone disrupting chemicals that have found things in them. And so I I really think the industry has been lying to itself. It doesn't want to believe that this is a problem that needs to be tackled. And everybody is so siloed that it took someone like me to interview the researchers over here, the experts over here, the designers who have gotten sick from just designing and touching the clothing, the garment workers, to pull it all together into one view and say, we have a problem here. Well, you know, it's interesting to hear you say that uh, an expert in the field would take such a reductionist approach. Well, we don't eat our clothing, so it, it's not dangerous. I'm not a doctor for clarity by any stretch of the imagination, barely graduated high school, but I'm pretty sure that our skin is the largest organ that we have, and we don't eat poison ivy either. But when it contacts your skin, you can have a reaction to it. And, you know, there's a, probably a reason why they don't want you swimming in sulfurous uh, bodies of water or they have exposure limits to all these other things. It's uh, it, it makes it hard to understand that person's mo – well – Maybe it makes it easy to understand that person's <laughs> motivation when it comes to a testing perspective. I mean, this uh, again. Yeah, I don't. I don't eat socks. I, I, I bet you there is somebody out there who does, and I feel like you. Well, should. Well, actually, <laughs> you do kind of eat your clothing. I, I'll tell you why. Please. <laughs> so you you've heard of microfibers? Of course. Yeah. Okay. So when we wash our clothing, you've heard that those microfibers go off in the wash and they get into bodies of water. They're also breaking off into our home's house dust. And there's 
re fresh research out of Duke showing that house dust from all, like all families contains sensitizing dyes that are used on polyester, mm -hmm. flame retardants, um, other hazardous chemicals. And so as it's accumulating in your house dust, that means you are breathing it in. It means you're ingesting it. Your kids, when they're crawling around on the floor, are definitely ingesting it. Your pets are 100% licking their paws and ingesting it. And those microfibers have in them and on them the dozens of finishes and dyes and contaminants that can end up on clothing. So it's actually not true that we don't eat our clothing. And if you're a baby, you're 100% putting that in your mouth. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I've heard BPAs associated, which is a microplastic, correct, the BPA? BPA is, um, no, it's a plasticizer. So it's used to make plastic soft and it's a hormone disruptor. It's an endocrine disruptor. And I've heard recently that, you know, we're finding that in people's bloodstreams due to the ingestion of fluid that they don't think that it is in. So it's, it's kind of the same concept. They're not intentionally ingesting it, but it's finding their way into the, the bloodstreams of people. <clears throat> oh, plot twist. They've also found BPA in sportswear, leggings, sports bras, men's uh, synthetic polyester spandex t-shirts. Really? So, yes. And on top of that, this isn't in the book because this research just came out in the past few weeks. There was uh, research, I want to say it was out of England, um, showing that when you sweat in clothing, especially synthetic clothing, your sweat draws out of that clothing, whatever's on there. So they did this research specifically on flame retardants, which was an interesting choice because clothing, actually the one bright spot is clothing doesn't really have flame retardants on it unless, you know, you work for a utility yeah. or you work, you know, in the petrochemical industry. But um, the researchers said, yes, extrapolating from that, we can say that sweat is very good at taking things out of fabrics when they are on your skin and depositing them on your skin. And if they're the kind of chemical that can be absorbed, that then ends up in your bloodstream. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be more fired up to introduce the presenting sponsor for season two of Change Agents, Montana Knife Company, founded by somebody that I feel very fortunate to call a personal friend, Master Bladesmith, Josh Smith. Not only a Master Bladesmith, but the youngest Master Bladesmith and one of the most experienced in the world. Montana Knife Company blades are some of the finest that I've ever been able to get my hands on. They are the sharpest knife out of the box, and they're some of the easiest to resharpen when you dull the blade. I take them everywhere that I go. I have them in every vehicle that I own and every backpack that I ever take into the backcountry. Specifically, my favorite blade of theirs is the Speed Goat. It's lightweight, but so incredibly capable. I never leave home without it. If you're familiar with Montana Knife Company, you know it is often very difficult to get one of their blades because they sell out within minutes of being released. What you should be able to find in stock are the Blackfoot 2.0, Speed Goat, or a Stonewall Skinner. And if you use the code CHANGEAGENTS10, that's gonna net you 10% off of your first order. Again, my personal favorite blade is the Speed Goat. If they have them in stock right now, don't mess around. Put it in your cart and complete the checkout. Montana Knife Company, they build working knives for working people. And like I said at the beginning, I could not be more proud to collaborate with them on Change Agents Season 2. You know, a lot of people look at the book and they say, oh, this is a woman's thing. But it's something that definitely affects men as well. I mean, I just shared that there's BPA in workout clothing. Um, there are phthalates in certain types of clothing there's pfas especially in performance gear like if you're a fisherman um or you know an outdoor person and you are putting on this weather resistant synthetic yeah. stuff every day you're being exposed to pfas which is also a really potent endocrine disruptor and that can affect men's fertility this is something that men need to think about in addition to keeping themselves really healthy is that if you're choosing the wrong outdoor gear or workout gear, it could be impacting your health. And what's crazy is you, you know, people view the great outdoors, you're, you're out and you're living life and you're pushing your body and exercising, you're doing it for the, the physical benefit and the mental benefit. And I, I've never once in my life decided what t-shirt to wear to work out because I was worried about the dyes or the processing of what mm -hmm. went into it. You could actually be fighting a very slow battle against yourself. 
even though you're trying to do the right things. You're trying to go out and live your best life, but you're undermining your efforts in the long term by what it is you're wearing. I wanted to go backwards a little bit to specifically Delta and the research that you did there. How quickly did you realize that there was something going on with uniforms, just kind of peeling that onion back till you got to the root issue? Yeah, I I mean, it was very quickly apparent that this was a problem because it happened at four different airlines and three different uniform makers. So it wasn't an accident, you know? I mean, the first time this happened at Alaska Airlines, there was like, oh, there was a one bolt of contaminated fabric or, oh, it was one supplier. We're no longer working with them. But it just kept happening. And I was like, okay, there is a systemic failure here and I need to figure out what it is. And I interviewed a woman named Heather Poole. She's also a book author. Um, she's a flight attendant at American Airlines and she'd become this big outspoken advocate um, fighting for the rights of her fellow flight attendants. She started a blog, she started a Facebook group where they could talk to each other. And when she told me the story about not just how sick they were getting, but also the way their employers were gaslighting them and telling them, oh, maybe it's just menopause or, oh, like, or go, they were going to their doctors and saying like, I can't think I have this rash. I'm mm -hmm. like, like some of them were taken off the planes and sent to the ER with breathing problems, anaphylaxis, wow. um, like flu-like symptoms, you know, all, all the, like they were in crisis and their employers were saying, this is a you problem. This is an individual sensitivity. And I just, you know, when I found out about this, I was like, these people, mostly women, some, some men, um, deserve to have their story told and deserve to have somebody in their corner, like advocating for them and telling the world about what they're going through. Because if they're going through this, like more people are going through this and their story can, can do some good. How did Delta respond when you or other researchers were able to find a preponderance of data pointing at that uniform? Yeah. So the way, so they went into, um, they went into damage control and the way they would do this and the uniform companies would do this and the other airlines would do this is that they would hire a lab to test the uniforms for a limited number of substances. And then they would hire a toxicologist to interpret those results. And then they would come out and they would say, good news. We've had the uniforms tested and our experts assure us that there is no reason for you to be having these health reactions, given the substances that we found are mostly under the limit. Now, there's a few ways in which they were crafting the narrative. One is that there are 40 to 60,000 chemicals in use globally in, the, in, in commerce today the vast majority of them have not been tested for health and safety. You cannot test for 40,000 different chemicals in a piece of clothing. So you have to select what you want to test for. And so you're never going to find out every single thing that's in there and every single thing that could be causing a problem for those flight attendants. Next, you've hired some people who are like you are their client. So they are going to interpret the results the way you want the results interpreted and in a way where they can like eventually could help defend them in court from liability. So they're just doing damage control. They even, um, I was told that they sent a cease and desist letter to a doctor who was helping flight attendants because he was running his mouth about what he was seeing in his office that, you know, these uniforms were causing an allergic reaction. I mean, they they did not want this getting out. Yeah, I can understand the, the PR nightmare they would have. I need one of these specialists to test apple pie for me, but not test for carbohydrates and only look for protein. So I can lie to myself and say, <laughs> this is moderately healthy. This There is some protein in this apple pie and we'll just ignore the rest. And I won't end up weighing 250 yeah. pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really, really good way to put it. <laughs> Yeah, and I, well, that, those are the lies that I'm willing to tell myself to enjoy apple pie because it's just the best. <laughs> How did it? I mean, there's fruit, you know. So yeah, there you go. With protein in it. That's all I'm interested. In. I'm not interested in sugar mm -hmm. count or carbohydrate at all. Mm -hmm. Where does the uniform issue sit with Delta today? Delta ended up without accepting the 
like they never admitted that the uniforms were toxic. Mm -hmm. They did sort of work around and say this is becoming an issue uh, and a distraction. So they ended up swapping out the uniforms. They're not making everybody wear the new uniforms because flight attendants have to pay for their uniforms. They have to buy them. So if you go on a Delta flight today, um, you'll see some people still wearing the old uniforms and some people wearing the new uniforms. Actually a good way to tell whether or not they have a good story because if they're still wearing the purple dress, that means they don't think that it's a big deal. And if they're wearing uh, the new uniforms, then um, then they might have had an issue that compelled them to spend hundreds of dollars on this new uniform. Let me just tell you right now, I travel on Delta a lot, and I apologize to all of the flight attendants that are on my future flights, especially if you're wear not wearing <laughs> the new uniform, because I might pull you aside. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, if they have an opinion about it, I think they'll be really, really happy to talk about it because, you know, it's it's really tough to not be believed. Yeah. Okay. So we'll pull it out of the the, the Delta Airlines and the, the people who help us get from A to B safely inside of the airplane. For somebody like me who hasn't thought about this, who has a, I, I have, I guess, workout clothes, but if I'm being honest, I kind of work out it. I, board shorts and t-shirts for me is 98% of my attire. That's just the way that it is. And I love that for you. <laughs> That's but I've not put a single bit of thought into, I have thought about, you know, where I get my clothing from. Um, I'm uh, an ambassador for a brand that is my slogan for them, not theirs, is dirt to shirt. It's an American uh, brand, uh, origin, Maine. They're out in Maine. It started in the jiu-jitsu world, but they're trying to tackle the manufacturing issue inside of the United States. And I not only support the people there because they're good friends of mine, but I support the resurgence of manufacturing and knowing the origin all the way to inception of the item of clothing. I've never asked them once, though, about, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them the benefit of the doubt uh, about the, the, the dyes that they use in their manufacturing process. But for somebody like me who is at, at a peripheral level or scratched the surface, only looked at where they source their goods from, where would you start somebody on the education? And then what actions would you recommend day one when it comes to the safety of these items that we're wearing around all the time? Yeah, there's definitely some things that people can do to reduce their exposure or their family's exposure to some of these hazardous chemicals. Because there's so few protections in the United States, especially for adult consumers, there's literally like no, there, there's no ban on any chemicals for adult clothing. And there's a ban on three chemicals for children's clothing. Um, so there's not a lot of resources to protect us, but there are some things that if you put all these strategies together, it can really reduce your exposure. So. The first thing I would say is that um, performance products, like performance fabrics that have trademark names are kind of a marketing scam because companies have realized that the only made way they can make a big profit on fabrics or fashion is to put a proprietary mix of chemicals or synthetic fibers in something, give it a fancy name, and then sell it at, at a markup. So if you see something that is anti-odor, wrinkle-free, easy care, uh, sweat wicking or quick dry, um, stain proof, water resistant, like any of these promises, it's usually almost always achieved with a chemical fi finish that includes some of these hazardous substances. So if you see like a trait, like Gore-Tex, mm -hmm. they've started switching to uh, like non-fluorinated, non-PFAS, uh, products, but they're not all the way there yet. Like that is a really good example of it's, it was just a fabric until they added this chemicals to it. And then they can upcharge for it and like tell this really fancy story about, you know, how great it is and how it's going to improve your hype and your, get you to the summit faster and blah, blah, blah. They, they patented. So that's the first thing I would Yeah. Say. I mean, they legitimately patented that technology. Um, and I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I can't, of course, name, but, but you'll speed wick or, you know, whatever the, the flashy subject line that you see. They're on, man, they're on almost every outdoor brand because they're all kind of aiming for the same thing. The wicking, but also breathable, but also water mm -hmm. resistant or waterproof. Yeah. And there are, I have a list on ecocult.com, my website, where I list PFAS free outdoor brands, boots non-toxic, whatever, whatever you want, you can, you can find it. But, uh, like I said, there's no ingredient list. So 
you kind of have to go out and look for the brands that have committed to going completely PFAS free in order to be sure that they don't have some of these fluorinated chemicals on them. Um, and the next thing I would say is uh, synthetic clothing is a higher risk for these sensitizers, endocrine disruptors, finishes. So I would say go for natural fibers whenever you can, whether that's bamboo, uh, bamboo rayon or lysol, cotton, linen, um, modal, um, you know, all, merino wool, like mm -hmm. I said, or regular wool. These are all uh, at they have a much lower risk of having these these hazardous chemicals on them. And then I would also say that you should never shop ultra fast fashion. So when I say ultra fast fashion, a lot of people say like, oh, you mean like H&M? No, I do not mean H&M. I call them fast fashion. They have a robust chemical management program. Um, I'm talking about the, the weird brands that you've never heard of that you see advertised to you on. They're incredibly cheap. You just see them on social media or Facebook or Amazon. I know exactly what you're talking about. They're oftentimes, they use very bizarre uh, spellings as well. Yeah. And they just like <laughs> smush a bunch of weird words yeah. together. Yeah. And Nanook. Yeah. And, and I think I just made that up. Sorry if there is a company called Nanook. I just kind of made that one up. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Totally. But it's stuff like that. But it, it'd be like two U's and one of them would have an umlauts for some reason. And Nanook would have two K's. Yeah. Or like, when it comes to women's fashion, it's like she pretty forever <laughs> or something like that. Um, <laughs> so these, okay, first of all, they're terrible value. I, I was talking to like in the course of researching the book, I was talking to customs officials, and this uh, these are people who like see all the bullshit that comes through our ports. And he was like, yeah, I, I like I was going to on a trip to to Italy with my family, and I bought a bunch of like travel clothing off of this Facebook ad and it was garbage and I never wore it. Like, yeah, I know. But the other problem with these things is that fashion, like you wanna shop at a fashion brand that has a reputation that they care about because it is expensive and you need to have a good relationship with your suppliers and care about this to ensure that your clothing doesn't have hazardous chemicals on it or contamination. It The supply chain is incredibly complicated a brand needs to know who is dyeing their clothing to ensure this. And a lot of brands don't know this, but those tiny little brands, they probably know who's supplying their clothing. And it's probably the factories that H&M won't work with because they're so sloppy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And like most of these big brands, like they have a policy where they require the, the, the factory to test things and send the certificate before they send them and then they test them again. And and yeah, these like tiny little brands, they, they are not doing that. And even if you were to email them and say, hey, your socks gave me a chemical burn, they probably wouldn't answer. If you try to get a refund, they won't answer. They don't care. They're yeah. like just moving on to the next sucker on social media. So what would you recommend for somebody who is going to listen to this or watch this and then go stand in front of their closet? Mm. Okay, so... I don't think anybody should go and throw out everything they own unless you are currently managing a pretty severe chronic health issue that is impacting your life. If that's you, you're saying, oh my God, like my son has such severe eczema, like this could help. Or, you know, I'm recovering from cancer and trying to decrease my exposure to endocrine chemicals, endocrine disruptors. Yeah, absolutely. Like go to your closet, take out the synthetic stuff, take out the ultra fast fashion, take out the performance stuff, uh, get rid of it, get it out of your house, you know, like stop dry cleaning things, get rid of all your scented detergents for sure. Do a whole clean out. I think it will make you feel better. If that's not you though, if you're chugging along and you're like, yeah, my health is pretty good. Um, don't, don't, don't feel like you have to throw anything out just as you move forward. Think about where you're buying your things from and slowly start to switch things out to optimize your wardrobe. Like I've known about this for a while and I still have a few synthetic workout clothes mm -hmm. in my rotation. Um, the black ones I don't need more, but the other ones seem to be okay. And so I'm, you know, I don't need or want to spend thousands of dollars today on switching out my entire wardrobe. So just do what feels right for you. There's a lot of things I like about the Mountain Tough program, but I think primarily 
what I enjoy is they focus on mental toughness in addition to just the physical toughness. Everything they do is grounded in one purpose, life transformations and being strong between the years in the mind. And there's also a community of 15,000 plus Mountain Tough athletes. So the community is strong, they're supportive, and they're gonna help keep you accountable. So you can train anywhere, you can stream anywhere, you can access guided training and on-demand workouts right from your phone, your tablet, or TV or computer, whatever you're into. And everything you need is in one spot. The Mountain Tough subscription gets you access to all the Mountain Tough programs, new programs, and bonus content. And they have programs for everyone. Those who hit the gym and heavy weights, those who like to work out at home with no gear or minimal gear, and everything in between. Mountain Tough has been the trusted training by the dedicated for years now, including U.S. military special forces and dedicated backcountry hunters. There is no excuse for you to not start today. With Mountain Tough, you can conquer your goals with the ideal program for your lifestyle and schedule. Train with equipment or just your body weight on your phone, tablet, TV, or web browser. Most importantly, they will help you train your mindset so you are always ready for anything that life throws away. Mountain Tough subscribers get full access to world-class home and gym programs, groundbreaking mental toughness training, self-improvement, prehab and rehab, biomechanical form coaching, stretching and mobility flows, nutrition guidance, challenge workouts, and the global Mountain Tough community. Mountain Tough is offering Change Agents listeners an incredible offer. You're going to get 40% off on the all-new Mountain Tough Plus annual subscription with the code CHANGEAGENT. Go to mtntough.com and enter the code CHANGEAGENTS to receive 40% off, a savings of about $100 on your Mountain Tough Plus annual subscription. That is MTN, Mike Tango November Tough.com and enter the code Change Agents to save 40%. That is less than 50 cents per day for the best in class physical and mental training. Good morning, everybody. As you know, Change Agents is an Ironclad original. But what you may not know is that for over a decade, Ironclad has worked with brands and individuals to create world-class films, series, podcasts, and ad campaigns. In fact, I've been working with Ironclad for the past few years. I was introduced to them on a project through the Navy SEAL Foundation. I've worked with them uh, on a variety of projects, even up here in Montana, long before they proposed the idea of change agents to me. They're the best in their field. And I say that because there are plenty of people out there looking for the best, looking for the cream of the crop, looking for the top of the triangle. And if you're looking for that, you need to look no further than Ironclad. If you ever need media by way of film, a series, podcasts, or ad campaigns, they have you covered. You can reach out today and follow them anywhere at This Is Ironclad, the ampersand, and then This Is Ironclad, or visit them online, thisisironclad.com. Again, www.thisisironclad.com. All right, so what are your top top three things that you avoid, that you would start people with, like avoid these like the plague? Yeah, um, avoid, yeah, avoid the performance finishes for sure. Okay. Um, I, like, especially also anti-odor. So anti-odor is usually achieved with uh, nano silver and it's, it's such a new thing, but there's starting to be research, there's starting to be data points that we don't want this next to our skin because it can, accumulate in certain organs. Uh, it's a known uh, toxic to marine life. Um, and we just like, we just shouldn't, like we shouldn't have an extra skin. And like I said, I so I, I re actually interviewed a textile, an odor textile researcher a few years back. And she said, according to our lab tests, a natural fiber is a better anti-odor fabric than a synthetic fiber with anti-odor finishes applied to it. Hmm. So. Um, so avoid performance finishes, avoid synthetics, um, avoid dry cleaning, actually. Um, I know it, like for a lot of men, it's just easier to drop off your stuff at the dry cleaner and not think about it. But dry cleaning uses a chemical, it's known as perk. It's so toxic that former dry cleaning sites are usually designated as federal super fund sites, which means they get federal funding to clean up all the toxins in the ground before anybody can build anything there. 
and you're that's getting applied to your clothing so if there's any way you can i mean be lazy if you have wool suiting you do not need to have it dry cleaned or cleaned all the time mm -hmm. it will let go of that odor it's very resilient you can spot clean um yeah i mean I, it's just uh, like be a little lazy about it spot clean um hand wash if you can just av avoid that if you can and and scented laundry products i was just works. gonna ask you about that because I, I i i thought i had caught you saying that and is are they the worst because they contain these same chemicals that you were talking about previously yeah so there's been research showing that um that like the air coming out of dryers you know when you walk past it smells so good though and you can smell it it smells so good oh no, no, no. <laughs> it's so bad those chemicals combine with each other to create known carcinogenic hazardous substances that are like technically banned in the united states and and people put so many of them on there and they stick to your stuff i mean if you talk to somebody who is sensitive and look one in five people are chemically sensitive and a lot of them don't call it that they might say like oh like i have a hard time when people have you know glade plugins or mm -hmm. like i don't really like scented products or like sometimes my asthma kicks in yep it, whatever you call it some people call it mastodal activation syndrome some people call it multiple chemical sensitivity one in five people are suffering from this and um oh they will tell you that they cannot deal with like if they're if they buy something secondhand and somebody's been using tide on it or if like you know they wash their friends or their nieces clothing in their washing machine that's been washed in tide or gain before it just incapacitates them hmm. so go with unscented laundry products skip the the fabric softener skip the um the dryer sheets i don't i don't really they don't really do much <laughs> in fact they're just sort of like a marketing product yeah, I think they pitch them as uh, you get a, it smells like the forest or the meadow, and I think it helps with the wrinkling. But again, I would rather have wrinkly clothing than materials on my body for hours at a time, especially if you're going to be sweating. So you've supported a piece of proposed legislation called the Fashion Act. And mm -hmm. what is that and what would it do? The, the Fashion Act is a legislation in New York State that would require brands to um to track to start to track and share information on their supply chain and uh i would love this because so like track your supply chain and also share impact metrics and i really like this because you know it was proposed as an environmental thing as a labor thing right but this is also a chemical thing because a lot of fashion brands don't know who is dyeing their clothing and who is finishing their clothing. And when you don't know that, that supplier will buy the cheapest chemicals possible to get the largest profit margin possible. And brands kind of know this, but they pretend they don't know. So when something happens, they say, oh, we're not working with that supplier anymore. They didn't follow our rules. Well, you should have known. And you should have done something about it. And you should have ensured that you had the right kind of processes and you were paying enough to give them the like the leeway to buy the certified safe chemicals that you say you want. So I think it's, it would be really good for accountability within the fashion industry. It wouldn't fix everything, but it would be a huge step forward. What do you think the likelihood of it passing is? God, I am not a politician or an <laughs> political analyst. I do not know. I know that there's a lot of people supporting it. I also know that in this instance, a lot of fashion brands were caught flat-footed. Like they, fashion brands don't have large lobbying um, apparatus yeah. the way some other um, some other industries do, but that could change. So, um, but some, I mean, some brands could be induced to support it. Brands like Patagonia. Um, I don't. I don't know. I I want it to pass, but I'm I'm a little bit of a pessimist. Yeah, well, sometimes from an objective viewer standpoint, it seems like politics and those in politics are working for their own self-interest as opposed to the self-interest of others. Yeah, I would agree with that. What's your next book going to be about? I'm trying to decide. <laughs> it's either going to be... Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's either going to be about the same topic, but our homes. So all the ways our homes are making us sick from the carpeting, the furniture, the construction materials, mold exposure, gas stoves, all of those different things that are contributing to really poor air quality. Um, I recently found out that there's actually no federal or state standards for indoor air quality. So hmm. even if you tested your indoor air quality, like there's not much you could do about it. Um, or there's one chapter in the book that a lot of people, like people who know about this really resonate with it and they feel really seen, but it's gotten a little bit less attention and it's about chemical sensitivity or mast cell activation syndrome. And there's a lot of fresh research in there about the biological mechanism behind it. You know, it's not just in your head. You're not just crazy. It's not psychosomatic. It's real. Um, and I would love to go down that rabbit hole and learn more about um, what people who are sensitive, highly sensitive to chemicals that are sort of normal for our everyday life today, like what their bodies are trying to tell us, like what that warning signal is, how that's happening and what we can do about it. I like it. Where can people find out more about you and the work that you've already done? So people can buy my book to die for at any place they like to buy books. I'm agnostic. Uh, it probably is at your local bookstore, support local bookstores. They can also find my freelance work for places like Wired and the New York Times at aldenwicker.com. And then if they want to learn more about uh, this particular topic and get some resources to shop more sustainably, then they can go to ecocult.com. Hope you all enjoyed today's episode. And I hope at the end of it, like it did for me, it made me stand in front of my clothing that I have at my house and start making smarter decisions, not only about what I wear, but how I wash them. If you want to learn more about Alden's work and the issues of toxic chemicals in clothes, you can check out ecocult.com. That is echo, as in the phonetic E, Charlie Oscar, Charlie Uniform, Limatango.com, ecocult.com. Thank you for listening to Change Agents, an ironclad original presented by Montana Knife Company. We'll be back next week with an all-new episode.